recently about the uh, passage in, in the scripture that talks about um, uh, the lion laying down with the lamb. And I thought I'd uh, uh, research that a bit further and maybe give a talk about that. And, uh, and so I did and I sorted it all out and so on because uh, the lion and the lamb are two titles that are actually given to Jesus Christ in the scriptures. And so I thought that maybe there's something in that we can have a look at and, uh, and that passage in particular of the lion laying down with the lamb. And as I researched that, I found out something really interesting. And that is that that passage doesn't actually exist. Uh, nowhere in the Bible does it say that the lion will lie down with the lamb. Uh, there is passages that indicate that. Uh, in Isaiah, we read about the wolf lying down with the lamb. And then at the end of that verse, I think it talks about the lion being at peace with the calves or something like that. Uh, so I suppose the implication is there, but those words don't actually appear. But of course, by that time, I'd started already thinking about um, uh, other things that uh, we might uh, have a look at. So you might like to open up your Bibles to the book of Revelation and uh, chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5. And uh, just to set the scene a bit, um, uh, in the book of uh, Revelation, the early parts of the book of Revelation, uh, particularly in chapters 2 and 3, uh, we know that there are messages there to the church. And uh, uh, the churches, of course, were not uh, buildings uh, and they were not uh, uh, groups of people that were just gathered together under some man-made doctrine, but rather they were spirit-filled and they were walking in the spirit. They were overcomers. They were uh, the, uh, uh, the New Testament church were, were people that did speak in tongues and, uh, and had uh, uh, just the, that wonderful relationship with the Lord that we enjoy today in, in, within our fellowship and so on. And, in those two uh, chapters, we read about the prophecies. I suppose uh, there's prophecy in those, in those chapters uh, as we read about the, the different phases, perhaps, that the church would go through uh, uh, and different timelines in history uh, from the time of John onward uh, and the, the situations that the church might find itself in. But they were also, of course, literal. Those groups of people in, in, uh, 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 in uh, Revelation chapters 2 and 3 were, um, were real groups of people. There really was a group of people at Ephesus and Philadelphia and so on and so on. Uh, people that, that were spirit-filled and that were going through the difficulties that, that we go through and perhaps even many more difficulties that we might go through. And uh, they were grappling with real problems uh, in their life and in their situation. And, uh, and I always, uh, uh, I suppose that the, the summary of it all for the, for the church is, is given to us over and over again in those chapters, he that overcometh. And that's really what it's all about because these chapters deal with oppositions and, and overcoming. They deal with a compromise, but then making a stand and, uh, and uh, uh, faithfulness and so on there. And the, the chapters that deal with the persecutions, but then the strength and the victory that we can have in the Lord and the comfort and so on of the Lord. And those chapters really are like a, a call to arms. Yes, it's about all the difficulties that they might be for the church, but it's also about the reward that there will be for those that stick it out to the end, that uh, overcome uh, right through uh, uh, to the end. That it's about the struggle, it's about the fight, but it's about the reward to the overcomer. Then the next chapter, chapter four, goes on to deal with the throne of God. And that chapter is all about the reward. It's all about glory. It's all about magnificence. It's all about the mighty thunders and lightnings that you can read in the pages, in the words of this particular chapter there, about the majesty of God around the throne of God and the breathtaking, uh, almost a, a heart-stopping splendor of, of what you read there in the scriptures is, is just quite astonishing. And then we come to chapter five. And chapter five, we starts off, we read about a book now, when it says a book there, it probably is referring to a scroll, uh, the scrolls that used to open sort of from right to left. And uh, uh, that's probably what it's referring to there. And how this particular scroll or book was sealed with seven seals. And uh, we think of the, the uh, ancient times when they used to get the sealing wax and seal uh, something as, uh, as being, uh, you couldn't open it unless you had specific permission to do so because it was sealed by the royal signet or the royal seal and so on there. It was unbreakable. 
for fear of death if you were, were to mess around with this. And this book that we read of here, we're going to start reading about here, was sealed. No one could open it. No one could read it. No one could understand it. Nobody, I think, we even says there could even look upon it there. Now, we might just start reading then in, the, in chapter 5 and verse 1. And we read here, And I saw, and this is after the, the throne of God there, when uh, John was speaking there, And I saw in the right hand of him that sat upon the throne a book written within and on the backside, so written on both sides of this scroll, and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a, a, a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy? to open the book and to loose the seals thereof. And no man in heaven, nor in the earth, nor under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. And I, that's John, wept much, because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, and neither to look thereon. And so John was, was overcome and distraught, because he couldn't open the book and he wouldn't know what was inside. Now, there are, of course, many explanations of, of what that book may have contained, uh, what was in the words there. Just got a couple of quotes, though, that perhaps summarise it. Uh, one person said, It perhaps is God's will, his final settlement of the affairs of the universe. Somebody else wrote and said, The book of the counsels, decrees, and the purposes of God relating to his church as to what more remarkable things should happen to it to the end of the world, which book is in the hand of the Father. Maybe that's a, a fair summary there. There are other sort of perhaps more wacky ideas about what that may have been. But, but just generally speaking there, it's obviously God's book. It's got information about God and about his plan. And it must be opened if we're wanting to, to find our future. Uh, we, we must be able to see perhaps in, in that book there, but we read here it couldn't be opened because no one was found worthy. And John was reduced to tears at that point there. This is God's book and it's out of our reach. It's beyond us. In fact, the word wept there actually means to wail aloud. He wasn't just quietly sobbing here. He was, it's almost like a just totally abandoned to grief uh, to, uh, not being able to, to read this book there because this book, which was dealing with God's future with mankind and mankind's future with God was destined to be out of the reach of mankind forever. It was never going to be in their hand there. It was forever closed. It was forever hidden there. And John couldn't have, uh, have written about it in a more graphic manner here as he's weeping at, uh, at this turn of events here. It seems as though this strong angel that we read about there in verse 2 there, it seems as though he, he searched the entire universe, all of the heavens, all of the earth, and it even says everything under the earth there. But there was not one person that was worthy to open that book. Not one person even to, to look upon, the last part of verse 4 there says, uh, look upon that book. But then we go on to read in verse 5, And one of the elders said unto me, Weep not. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Hold those tears, John. There is one who is worthy, the lion of Judah, because he hath prevailed. That word prevailed means to overcome or to conquer. And who is this, of course, is talking about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He's described in Isaiah, I've got a quote here, uh, of being of the line of David. Here in Revelation, it indicates there that he was actually the origin of David. He's the root of David. But uh, in, in Isaiah chapter uh, 11, we read there, And there shall come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, and a branch shall grow out of his roots. So he was of the line of David and of that branch. Of, uh, of the growth uh, of the tree of the Lord there that God had planted uh, in the line of David there. And he was also of the tribe of Judah, of course. We know David was of the tribe of Judah, but not just of the tribe of Judah, but Jesus Christ, of course, is described as being a champion of Judah, of a prevailer in Judah, 
of a hero of Judah, of the glory of Judah, a lion of Judah. And just quote here from, from uh, Genesis chapter 49. This is uh, when uh, uh, Jacob was uh, uh, bestowing blessings upon his sons who were to form the tribes of Israel. And so as he's speaking here to uh, Judah, and he's uh, particularly uh, bestowing a blessing upon him, we ought to be thinking about Christ, I believe, in these words. And as we do, they take on quite a meaning for us. This is what Jacob said about Judah, his son, uh, in, uh, in uh, Genesis chapter 49. Judah, thou art he whom thy brethren shall praise. Thy hand shall be on the neck of thine enemies. Totally victorious, in other words. Thy father's children shall bow down before thee. It's a, a, quite an astonishing prophecy of Christ here. Judah is a lion's, a lion's whelp, like a lion. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion, and as an old lion, or a mature and strong lion, who shall rouse him up? The scepter, or the, the royalty, that the royal decree shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet, until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. And then it describes him binding his foal unto the, unto the vine and his ass's colt. And, and we think about, uh, we're going to have a look a little later on about the time when Jesus came into the city of Jerusalem upon an ass's colt. Uh, and his ass's colt unto the uh, choice vine. He washed his garments in wine and his clothes in the blood of grapes. His eyes shall be red with wine and his teeth white as milk. That's quite a description there, which is uh, uh, very similar to the description of Christ appearing in the book of Revelation. And so we're reading here really about the greatest of the tribe of Judah, the greatest of any tribe, the greatest that has ever existed in the history of this universe, and the greatest that has ever been and ever will be the Lion of Judah, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's who's being described here, prevailing and overcoming and conquering, heroic and uh, commanding respect and awe, not just uh, uh, commanding our attention and our, uh, our respect there, but he commands our lives and demands our lives in all of this. Now, we may not think of, of Christ as being a fighter uh, and perhaps described as a, a lion, and uh, perhaps apart from the time when he, he uh, uh, drove out people in the temple with a, uh, with a whip, it uh, would appear at one stage there in the, the Gospel of John. Uh, well, we, we don't uh, actually uh, uh, see of him uh, uh, lifting fingers and fighting against people and uh, taking up arms and so on there. He didn't fight natural battles with natural weapons against natural enemies, but he did fight. He fought against sin. He fought against darkness. He fought against uh, death itself and the grave. And in fact, he went down into the grave fighting for the things of God, for light, for truth, for life, and that more abundantly and that eternal for his people. He got locked into the most terrible combat with him who, uh, as uh, the scripture records for us in the book of Hebrews there, has the power of death. That is the devil. He was locked into that uh, uh, combat with the devil there. And Jesus, the Lion of Judah, fought him and defeated him and rose victorious over him. He went down into the devil's realm, the grave, and he destroyed the power of the devil and he rose from the dead. Now, uh, uh, we're going to keep coming back to Revelation 5, so you might like to put a bit of a marker there. If you've got uh, uh, something you can put as a marker there in your Bible, I'll just do the same in mine. And we'll go uh, uh, to the Gospel of John, chapter 19. John 19. And uh, this, of course, is the time when, when Jesus was uh, uh, standing before Pilate, uh, at this time. And uh, uh, we'll just read in verse 5. Most of us are very familiar with this story, of course, but in verse 5, then came Jesus forth, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. And Pilate said unto them, Behold the man. And in verse 6, And when the chief priests therefore and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said unto them, You take him and crucify him. 
for I find no fault in him. It's interesting to note that I think there were four occasions on which Pilate said those words. Four different times when he said, I can't find any fault in him. This man is completely innocent of all that he's been charged with. And so uh, he says it here. And, and the Jews answered him and said, we have a law and by our law, he must die or he ought to die because he made himself or said of himself that he was the son of God. Then we read in verse eight. And then Pilate, therefore, when he heard that saying, he was the more afraid. And he went again into the judgment hall and he said unto Christ, whence art thou or where are you from? And Jesus gave him no answer. And then said Pilate unto him, speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have the power to crucify thee and I have the power to release thee? And Jesus answered, thou could have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Uh, therefore he that delivered uh, me uh, as the chief priest and so on there unto thee has the greater sin. Now he's speaking here to Pilate. And this is probably on the surface of it, one of the most unequal uh, conflicts going on here. Pilate is, is representative here of the might of the Roman Empire. That he was the most powerful man in this situation here at this time. He only had to click his fingers and you were dead and dragged off and died a horrible death and so on there. He had the power of everyone's lives in this place within his hand, within his grasp. And Jesus said to him, you've got no power. Jesus, beaten and almost broken and bruised and, and bloodied and, uh, and spat upon, all of those things. And he said to Pilate, you've got no power. And then we read there in verse 8, Pilate was afraid. This was something that was beyond him. Now, uh, uh, I'd like to just go over to uh, the Gospel of Matthew in chapter 28, if we can. Matthew 28. And I'm just starting to realise now that I should have looked at the clock before I started. But anyway, hallelujah. Ooh, I'm sure we'll get there. Matthew 28. Of course, I could look at the clock now and start from now. That might be a good thing to do, might it? Matthew 28. And uh, this now is dealing with, of course, the time of the resurrection of Jesus. In verse 1, Matthew 28, verse 1. In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher or the grave. And behold, there was a, a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven. The, that's amazing, isn't it? The angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. And his countenance was like lightning. What, a, what an amazing description here. He looked like lightning. I understand in Fresno, well, in California, having lots of trouble with lightning at the moment, uh, causing all sorts of uh, issues with fires and that sort of thing. And Lightning is a pretty impressive thing. Uh, I've got a lightning story. Perhaps I'll just share with you my lightning story. Uh, we had a, uh, uh, I, I live uh, in, in South Australia, Adelaide, South Australia, and at the back of our garden, we have a, a garden shed. And uh, we live on a corner block, and that shed is quite near the side street, the, um, uh, the fence of the side street there. And uh, we had this incredible storm come through Adelaide one time many years ago. And, uh, and I, was, uh, I looked out of the window of my house and the wind was really howling and really blowing and there were hailstones fall, uh, falling and that sort of thing. And it looked like it was really going to come in heavy. And I looked and I saw all of a sudden the roof of my shed started to lift off in the wind. Like it was breaking all the, uh, the screws that uh, I had uh, put in there and uh, probably hadn't done correctly in the first place anyway, if the truth be known. But uh, the, the roof was starting to lift and I suddenly had visions of these sheets of iron flying down the street. And, decapitating people that happen to be walking by. And so I thought, oh, I better go and fix it. So I, I went running out. I thought what I'll do is I'll pull all the sheets off and, and put them on the ground and, and let it rain in the shed. It doesn't really matter. There's nothing in there sort of thing. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll just uh, make it safe. That's all I wanted to do. And so I, I went running out into the shed there and the, the roof was peeling off and uh, I, uh, I pulled some bits off and that. And then all of a sudden there was this incredible flash and it lit up the inside, inside of the shed there with this incredible like ultraviolet light. And just before that happened, I got this amazing taste of sulfur in my mouth. 
and uh, and then this flash happened and a split second later there was this in, this deafening thunderclap that happened it was almost identically in time to the flash of lightning the thunder hit and so it must be very close i don't know where it was but everything lit up and uh, i suddenly had a great revelation i suddenly thought to myself nobody's going to be walking down the street at this time of day in these conditions here i might run into the house and that's what i did as fast as my little legs had carried me i ran back into the house there and i think lynn was uh, standing there watching weren't you and, uh, uh, and she, she she saw it happen and uh, and saw me running full belt across the lawn back into the house there that's my lightning story it's impressive stuff when you're close to it and this person here this being this angel his countenance his appearance was like lightning and his raiment was as white as snow. And for fear of him, the keepers, the, the guards of, of the tomb there, did shake and became as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not, for I know that you seek Christ which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen, as he said. And then he said to them, Come, see the place where the Lord lay. Come and see. Come and see this grave. Come and see this place of the dead, this place that's supposed to be a place of, of defeat and despair and anguish and sorrow. Come and see, because he's not here. He's gone now. He was there. He was in that tomb, but he's not now. And he never again will be in a tomb. Come and see. Look, marvel at this thing here. In the book of Revelation, we read, uh, Jesus uh, talking and he says I am he that liveth and was dead I was dead and behold look or, or behold means to look or to look attentively so I made a mess of that didn't I I am he that liveth and was dead and behold I am alive forevermore I was dead but I'm alive forevermore what glory there is in that what majesty there is in that there's nothing ever recorded in the history of the universe like that. He prevailed over death. He prevailed over death. And the Bible says in Revelation, we'll go back to Revelation now. The Bible says of Jesus, he is worthy. Hallelujah. Now we got to, uh, I think, uh, verse uh, five there. We'll carry on reading verse six. And so we just read there. How that he's described as the lion of the tribe of judah and then we read an elder uh, well that the elder said that uh, about him there the elder spoke of, of the lion there and then we read in verse six and behold and i beheld john beheld and so he's looking he's expecting to see as the curtain is drawn back on this whole situation he's expecting to see this lion there and I beheld and lo in the midst of the throne and in the midst of the four beasts and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it had been slain having seven horns and seven eyes which are the seven spirits of god should point out there's only one holy spirit of course uh, but it's interesting to note i think it's in isaiah 11 where it talks about the uh, 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 the spirit of god and it has seven attributes of wisdom and counsel and understanding and might and, and so on and so on there i can't remember them all there but uh, it lists seven attributes i think rest is one of them and so on and so uh, uh, we see john here He's expecting to see a lion, but he sees a lamb, the lamb of God. Again, Jesus Christ. Again, put a marker there, uh, and we'll go uh, back to the book of uh, Matthew, chapter 21. Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 21. It's actually one of my favorite passages of scripture and uh, 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 wherever I can, I work it into a talk just for my own personal satisfaction. And uh, hopefully you'll just uh, uh, put up with that just for the time being. Matthew 21, verse one. And when they drew nigh, this is now, I should set the scene a bit for this. This is the last time that Jesus came into Jerusalem, just before he was, just days before he was crucified. Everything is coming to a culmination. There was a, a great procession of people that followed him. We read about there. Along the way, only a, a short while before this, he'd raised Lazarus from the dead. 
He'd healed blind, blind Bartimaeus. He'd, he'd done all sorts of astonishing things along the way there and accumulated more and more people. And this crowd was following him. I think in one part in Luke, it says, they thought that this might be the overthrow of the Romans and, and all of that sort of thing that uh, was going through their mind there. And when they drew nine, verse one, uh, unto uh, Jeth, uh, Jer Jerusalem, and they were come to Bethphage, unto the Mount of Olives, then sent Jesus two disciples. And he said unto them, go into the village over against you, and straightway you shall find the ass, uh, an ass tied, and a colt with her. Loose them and bring them unto me. And if any man say aught to, uh, unto you, you shall say, the Lord has need of them, and straightway he will send them. All this was done, that it might be fulfilled that was spoken by the prophet, saying, tell ye the daughter of Zion, behold thy king, capital K there, cometh unto thee, meek, and sitting upon an ass, and the, and the a colt, the foal of an ass. And Jesus went, uh, sorry, the disciples went and did as Jesus commanded them. And they brought the ass and the colt, and they put uh, on them their clothes, and they set him thereon. And a very great multitude spread their garments in the way. Others cut down branches from the trees and strawed them in the way. And the multitudes that went uh, before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And when he was coming to Jerusalem, all the city was moved, saying, Who is this? And the multitude said, This is Jesus, the prophet of Nazareth of Galilee. And Jesus went into the temple of God and cast out all them that sold and bought in the temple and overthrew the tables of the money changers and the seats of them that sold the doves. And he said unto them, It is written, My house shall be called a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of thieves. And then we read, And the blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. This is a, a wonderful verse, verse 14. It's a verse that, that perhaps uh, it occurred to me one time, it's almost like a, a, a Reader's Digest sort of verse. And what I mean by that is that, um, I don't know, many people perhaps, uh, uh, back in the old days when people used to read books, uh, there were um, uh, books that would be a, a compilation of four novels, uh, and uh, Reader's Digest would put them together and they would condense them. Uh, and I don't know how they did that because they still read okay and still got the, the story of what was going on in the, uh, uh, the, the picture of what was going on in the story and so on there. But it was a condensed version. You got everything you needed to know. And this verse is like that. It just says the blind and the lame came to him in the temple and he healed them. It's almost quite stark in what it says there. And there's a lot more. It, it tells us exactly what we need to know, but it, there's a lot it doesn't tell us. It doesn't tell us of what it would have been like to be in that situation at that time. It doesn't tell us about people who would have been born blind in that temple at that time that Jesus opened their eyes. It doesn't tell us what their reaction would have been. It doesn't tell us even somebody who may have lost their sight and had lost the ability to see a sunset or to see their family or to see a, a wonderful scene of, uh, of, of God's creation or whatever. And they'd lost that. And they were destined to spend the rest of their life in darkness. It doesn't tell us what it would have been like that moment when he, he touched them and their eyes were opened and they saw again. I remember uh, 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 reading a story about a, a woman who, who had been blind. Uh, I, I think she, uh, um, there's a, a few stories about uh, people that have gone through situations like this and she had an operation and uh, and and the tension that as they were uh, it got to the, the the day when they were going to unwind the bandages from her eyes and the the, the tension you could feel it in her writing as, as she's recalling what happened there and uh, and they they unwound these bandages from her eyes and and instantly she could see and light flooded in and she she just uh, let out this great exclamation i can see and, and she looked around and everybody in the room was, was overjoyed and, uh, and there was all sorts of things happening there. And, uh, and, and uh, she wanted to find the doctor who performed the operation. It was apparently in the room. And, uh, and uh, she said, Where, where's Dr. Stones? Dr. Harris or whatever his name was. And uh, where is he? And one of the nurses said, he's out in the corridor. She said, well, that's a bit rich. You know, this is a, a tremendous time in my life here. He's probably out there filling out forms or something. You know, that's what he's doing there. And she turned to the nurse and she said, what's he doing out there? And she said, he's crying. And that's what it would have been like here at this time. People that were, were overwhelmed 
with what was going on here. He healed them. There would have been people running back to their houses. Come on, mom, you've got to come. I know you can't walk properly. I'll drag you along. He's healing people in the temple. And there would have been excitement. If we get a bit of a picture of that in the next verse there. Uh, when it talks about the chief priests and the scribes that uh, saw the wonderful things that he did and the children crying in the temple and calling out, uh, uh, saying, Hosanna to the son of David. But this is, this is an electric situation that was happening here at this time there. And it occurred to me when, uh, uh, when, when, when we read this and we, we look at this in, in context there, as he came into the city and all of this happened here, this is happening just days before the Passover. The Passover was on the 14th day of the first month. You can read about that in the book of Exodus when the Lord ordained the, the, the time frame and how things should be done in the Passover. And that was a time when a lamb had to be sacrificed. And this day, if you go back uh, through the Gospels, you can see that there's a, uh, and the, the next day, and then the next day this happened, the next day that happened, and so on. It would appear as though working backwards from the 14th day when Jesus was crucified on the Passover day. Then we read, uh, well, we can work out that this is actually the 10th day of the month. This is four days before the Passover. And in the book of Exodus, we read, and in the 10th day of the month, they, they shall take to them, every man shall take, a lamb to be sacrificed. This was the choosing of the lamb day. This is the day when Israel had to choose their lamb. And that's what they were doing. When Israel got together here in Jerusalem, and uh, not only from Israel, but others as well, from all nations that, that were gathered and the multitudes that went before and that followed and the multitudes in the city and so on there, they were crying out what they were doing, even though they didn't really know they were doing it. They were choosing their lamb to be sacrificed. And it was not just Israel. It was, uh, as, as I made mention there, we read of people from all nations being in Jerusalem for feast days and so on. There, there would have been people from all nations there. All of mankind was choosing their lamb here in this situation. Jesus Christ to be the lamb or the sacrifice of God. And we'll just go to uh, uh, Isaiah 53, just for a couple of verses there. And we're familiar, of course, with the, uh, with the passage in Isaiah 53. But uh, again, it's a wonderful passage that, that I don't think you can ever read uh, too many times. Isaiah 53. And uh, uh, just a, a couple of verses. Just to, where should we start? Perhaps in, I think it's got verse uh, 3, perhaps. What time to, I'm looking at the clock and it's totally irrelevant, really, isn't it? Uh, and uh, just these verses here, it, it always strikes me when you read this about how personal this is for every one of us. Isaiah writes here about a person being despised, obviously about Jesus being despised and rejected and so on there, but, but he doesn't refer to it as someone dying for their sins. It's inclusive of you and me. It's, if, if you look through this passage of the next few verses, how it talks about we and us and our. It's you, it's me that is, is in effect writing this about us. And it's good that it's about the person sitting next to us or the person in our fellowship or whatever, but really it's about you. It's about your relationship. It's about what God has done for you, about, about his sacrifice for you. Let me read here in verse three. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, his, hid, as it were, our faces from him. And he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken and smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions and bruised for our iniquities. And for the, chastise, uh, the chastisement of our, our peace, was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and we've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. A particular verse I'd like to think about down in verse 12, the last verse there. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sins of many and made intercession for the transgressors. 
So in the midst of this passage, or rather the culmination of this passage here, which to the world is, is all about pain and despair and defeat. There's a couple of words used there. Great and strong as it describes the Lamb, the Lamb of God. We might think of, of as the world would perhaps look upon that, and, and maybe we, we could forgive them for thinking that, but it's not, this isn't about weakness and about defeat and about despairing here. Not for you and I. It was impossible for Christ, but he did it. But for you and I, well, nothing could be further from the truth if you're thinking about defeat and despair, because this is love in its purest form. And this is strong. And this is great. This is conquering. This is victorious. This is prevailing. This is Jesus Christ laying a foundation to, for the change that an un, unregenerate man could have and how that we could be transported from, from the earthly, having our names written, and we were reading the book of Jeremiah, in the dirt of the ground, being transported from there to the heavenly and having our names written in heaven. From the grave to the heavens is what this is all about here. This is a picture of a lamb, but it's a lamb that's a lion, the lion of Judah. And look at the next verse there. It goes on, you know, in the, in the original writings, of course, there was no uh, uh, breaks for verses and chapters and so on there. It just carried on. And so we read here about this incredible sacrifice of the Lamb of God. And the conclusion to it all, if you like, is in the next verse there. Sing, O barren, thou that could not bear. Break forth into singing and cry aloud. And it goes on to talk about the joy there. Sing, because we were barren. We were lifeless. The Bible says we were dead in trespass and sin. We were helpless. We were hopeless. And now we're told here to sing because of where the Lord has blessed us to be. This is a great story. And uh, let's uh, just go back to uh, Revelation there. We'll finish off uh, the chapter here and uh, go through it there. Revelation 5 and... Uh, we read verse 6, I think, didn't we? So we're starting verse 7. And so uh, he's now had the lamb revealed to him. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. So this lamb now comes, uh, and lion, the lion and the lamb, all in one personage here, comes and takes the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, everyone having with them harps and golden vials of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. There's so much in all of this, of course. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy, thou art worthy to take this book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. What a great thought that is. You know, here am I on one side of the world and, and you're mostly sitting on the, the other side of the world. There may be a few interlopers from Australia watching all of this, but, but mostly everybody is a long way away from me. And it may well be that we will never, ever meet in this life, but we're one. We're one in the spirit. We're one in Christ. We're one even with those that have gone before. The Bible describes us here as being redeemed unto God. Redeemed, purchased, paid for by the blood of the Lamb, who in reality is the Lion of Judah. And then we're going to read there. And uh, he has made us uh, unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. And I beheld and heard the voice of many angels around about the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was 10,000 times 10,000. 10,000 times 10,000. Carry the one. 100 million. 100 million angels singing around the throne. Now, I don't, I've never heard an angel sing. I'm quite looking forward to it, actually. Uh, but... I guarantee you they don't sing softly. The noise that's, that there would be as a hundred million 
angels. And then it says, uh, uh, and thousands of thousands, a few more extras as well, all singing their praises. Elsewhere, we read about the, the voice in heaven sounding like uh, thunders and mighty waters and, and, uh, and all of these things there. They're singing their praises to God. And this is what they're singing and saying there in a loud voice in verse 12, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them say, uh, I heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever the whole universe singing what's described here as a new song of praises unto Christ. And the four beasts uh, said, Amen. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. And all the people said, I hand back to you.